Eschatology. Having just finished the question of the doctrine of the church, which has a lot of profound truth in it, I trust you study your theological notes and not just take them. Won't do you any good in a file. Eschatology. This is made up of two Greek words, eschatos and lagos. Eschatos means last or final. Lagos means word, discourse, teaching. Same word used of Jesus. Jesus is the Lagos. Putting the ideas together, of course, we get the doctrine of last things. So that's the last study in theology. We started with predestination so that you could make it through eschatology. <laughs> because if you didn't believe you were predestinated to be here, you wouldn't have made it. And some didn't. Some didn't. But predestination has more to do than just predestinating you to have a seat here. But that's included in predestination. The doctrine of last things. We'll be dealing under this study, physical death, the intermediate state where the spirit is between death and the resurrection, second coming of Christ, antichrist, resurrection, judgments, the final eternal state, and so on. I'm not giving an outline because I don't know quite yet all that I'll deal with under this heading. So that's something of what we mean by last things. It's like in Revelation, God told John to write what you have seen, the things which are, and the things which are to come. So this deals only with subject matter concerning things to come. It could be entitled that. There's a book called Things to Come by Dwight Pentecost. If you can read through the non-charismatic attitude, there's a wealth of information in that book. But you better be charismatic before you read it, because he doesn't believe in that. All right, so as I say, the first topic is death. That's where we begin, because we're dealing with the doctrine of last things. We start with death, then the intermediate state, and so on. Now, in ethics under this subject, we were dealing with moral and ethical questions concerning terminal illness, death, the funeral, death as it relates to survivors in that study. Here, we're making a theological study of death as it relates to the individual who dies. Where is he? And so on. What's death mean to him? So we're not overlapping in any sense. Two different areas under the same heading. In ethics, we were studying the problems and questions, ethical questions, moral questions, and so forth with relation to death as it affects survivors. Here, death as it affects the individual. Now, first of all then, with reference to all mankind, the word death is used to describe three different experiences as it affects all mankind, whether Christian, non-Christian, saved, unsaved. The term death in scripture is used to describe three distinct experiences. First of all, the term death in scripture speaks of spiritual death, spiritual death. Many passages, one is Ephesians 2 and verse 1. Ephesians 2 and verse 1. Now since this is a theological study, we'll be looking up scriptures. Spiritual death. Death isn't just a static thing in the Bible. It has three aspects. And you hath he quickened, you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. 
Well, the word quickened is the old King James, of course, made alive. So he speaks to the Ephesians saying, they've been made alive, but they were dead. Well, not physically dead, obviously, or he couldn't have been writing to them. They were dead in trespasses and sins, spiritual death. Now, many passages show that, and you know that fact without us having to run references. And so here we're dealing with death as a separation from God. That's what spiritual death means. Death as alienation from God. That's the present state of all who are unsaved. They are spiritually dead. They do not have the life of God in their souls. They are alienated from God. You see, that's what, that's what it means to be dead in trespasses and sins. The person isn't actually dead. In fact, his spirit isn't dead. He is immortal. His soul is immortal. We'll just use the terms interchangeably. We've already gone through theology on body, soul, spirit. Okay, so many times in this last study, I'll use the terms interchangeably. But I mean the person, see, by saying either soul or spirit. The person isn't even dead spiritually. He's dead with reference to the life of God. He is alienated from God. Adam didn't die spiritually in the sense that his spirit or soul died. That's immortal. See, a sinner will spend eternity as a spirit in eternal punishment. And so a lot of people get confused on what spiritual death means and so forth and so on. And therefore, they're confused on a lot of other things. But... He explains what spiritual death is in Ephesians 2.1. Dead in sins and trespasses. He's writing to people who were alive, but they were dead in sins and trespasses. They were spiritually alienated from God and His life. But see, every personality will survive. It's immortal. So you think about that. They're not bodies. They're persons. The body is a part of the personality, as we've already taught you under body, soul, and spirit, the biblical view of that, but they don't cease to be when their bodies cease to be. All right, so spiritual death is separation of the person from God, alienation. When the scriptures speak of death, secondly, there is an aspect which is physical, and that's physical death. Spiritual death, then physical death. James 2.26 as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Now we use that for teaching faith without works is dead, but he's also teaching another truth. The body without the spirit is dead. The spirit isn't dead. The body's dead. There's no verse in the Bible that teaches the spirit's dead whether you're saved or unsaved. So physical death is the separation of the body and the spirit. Spiritual death, separation of the spirit and God. Here, separation of the body from the spirit, or vice versa. Soul and spirit, soul and body are separated. Spirit and body, we're using them interchangeably. Physical death. That's what physical death is. That's why it's quite abnormal. Then there's another term in scripture when it speaks of death, and that's called the second death. There's a second death in Revelation 20, verses 13 to 15. Now, you don't want to experience this one. Amen. Only the wicked experience the second death. If you turn to Revelation 20, 13 to 15, we'll see there's a third type or aspect of death. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works, and death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. See, the lake of fire is hell. It's translated death and hell were cast into the lake of fire in the King James. But the Greek is that death and Hades were cast into hell. Lake of fire is a synonym for hell. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire or experienced the second death. The second death then brings the unsaved person into a final and permanent state. 
Physical death does not. Spiritual death does not because he can be redeemed if he'll believe the gospel. But the second death is irrevocable. It's permanent. It's eternal. It's forever. So death, first of all, as it pertains to all mankind, is used three ways in Scripture. Spiritual death, physical death, and then there's a second death, which the unsaved will experience. Now, from what we've already said, you will notice three things are apparent. First of all, the central idea in all of this is separation. In all the forms of death is separation. Spiritual death is separation of the spirit from God. Physical death, separation of the spirit from the body. The second death, eternal separation of the spirit from God and all the people of God, all mankind. So the central idea in all three forms of death is separation. Now, spiritual death, all men experience. We all experience that. You've already been dead spiritually. There isn't a person here that hasn't been dead spiritually. But none of you here have been dead physically, obviously. But spiritual death is the experience of all men. Physical death is not the experience of all men. Enoch and Elijah were translated that they should not see death. And good news tonight. My Bible says in more than one place, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15, there will be a group of people at the close of the present age that will not die. They will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Hallelujah. Amen. And I'll tell you, they're called by a very familiar term around here, at least, overcomers. Now, that doesn't mean that, again, you have to sit under the fullness of the word. We're not saying that a person who is saved and dies wasn't an overcomer. That isn't what I said. I said a group at the close of the age. Come for a year or two and hear the whole teaching, and you'll find out that God is preparing a people for the end time to use, to minister. They will be his first fruits overcomers. Moses was an overcomer, you see, in that sense. Every Christian is an overcomer. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith, 1 John 5. So there are a lot of aspects to overcoming. And so when we use the term in the context of the end time message, we're talking about that group of people the scriptures speak of that will not die. They will be changed. Now, if we have God's word for it, let's don't be afraid to say it. The manifestation of the sons of God is taught in Romans 8. That's in connection with 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4. That there will be a group that will be manifested to this groaning creation. And it certainly isn't the same teaching of the manifested sons groups. Because <laughs> they're not in agreement with me. And we're certainly not in agreement with some of those groups that teach there's no resurrection and no second advent. Well, before you get through the study of eschatology, you'll see we strongly believe in both of those. Resurrection of the body and literal, visible return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Spiritual death is the experience of all men until they're saved, those who are saved. Physical death is not the experience of all men, but most men. Now, the remedy for spiritual death is eternal life in Christ Jesus. The remedy for physical death is the promise of the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15. There is no remedy for the second death. None whatever. That's why some have invented the doctrine of annihilation, which we'll get to sometime later. Secondly, let's look at the nature of death. We'll be dealing for the rest of the remainder of this study, at least, with just physical death because the spiritual aspects of death were dealt with back under the doctrine of redemption and sin. And we'll be dealing more with the spiritual aspect when we get to the end time 
where the spirits are and all at the time of death. But right now we're only talking about physical death under this study. That first point was a general understanding of what we mean or what the scriptures mean by death. It's in three aspects. Now the nature of physical death. Physical death, as we've already shown, is separation of the spirit and the body. Soul and body, spirit and body. Genesis 35, 18 shows it's a separation. That's what death is, a separation. As long as the two are together, they may be in a coma, they may look dead. Not infrequently, people thought someone was dead when they weren't. It might have been caught up in the third heaven like Paul, and they looked dead. But their spirit were still attached to their body by the cord, the silver cord that Solomon speaks about in Ecclesiastes. Genesis 35, 18 shows that death is a separation of the soul and body. And it came to pass as her soul was departing, for she died. She called his name Ben-Oni, but his father called him Benjamin. The last son of Jacob. His mother died, and as she died, we have it described as her soul departing, for she died. So physical death is a separation of the soul and the body. It isn't just a person quitting breathing. It's separation. And of course, we've already given you James 2.26, the body without the spirit is dead. Now on the physical side, death is the cessation of life in the body and its dissolution. Death means cessation of life in the body and its dissolution. That's why embalming is an Egyptian abomination. It's supposed to dissolve. Physical death is the cessation of life in the body resulting in the dissolution of the body. 2 Corinthians 5.1, Paul says, if this tabernacle be dissolved, I have another reserve for me. So the tabernacle, your body, is supposed to dissolve. John 11.39. You remember what Martha said to Jesus when he was going to go to the tomb and raise him? By the way, he wasn't embalmed, was he? Been dead four days. And she said, no, you can't get near the body after four days. In fact, she was quite plain. She said, he stinketh. So it's supposed to be that way. As we'll see a little later, the natural thing is dust to dust. From dust to dust, God said. And if you try to interfere with that process, you're interfering with divine prerogatives. That's why the Jews don't embalm. All right, from the physical side, it's cessation of life in the body, it's dissolution. From the spiritual side, physical death introduces the person or the spirit into a conscious Existence, which is intermediate between death and the resurrection. From the spiritual side, physical death isn't just the body dying, but it's introducing the person, which is the spirit, into a new state of conscious existence, which is not final, but intermediate between death and the resurrection. Call your attention to Luke 16. Luke chapter 16, verse 19 and following. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desires to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. I used to quote this passage by heart. I had me a favorite sermon. The Lord sent me out to a lot of churches back in my college days, and I really preached Baptist hellfire and brimstone. 
on this one. No second chance. That's a good passage for no second chance. I used to quote it by heart. Well, I can just about do it now. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Where is he? The next verse. And in Hades, Greek Hades, that intermediate place. See, hell is the final place, the lake of fire. In Hades he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy upon me. Send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, and I really stress that. So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. One woman said, you preach like there's some unsaved Baptists in this church. I said, you're, you're preaching like somebody's unsaved here. Well, I said, you have to be kidding. I did say that. I said, you have to be kidding. Like she thought they were all saved because they were church members. Well, we will deal with this passage when we get to the intermediate state, but that shows you that where the righteous are and where the wicked are are separated, but it's not the final state, it's an intermediate state. Here, called Abraham's bosom and Hades. Abraham's bosom, of course, signifying a place of repose and rest. Then Revelation 6, 9 to 11 speaks of the souls under the altar. They're not yet completed. The saints who are waiting for judgment to take place against the wicked and the completion of everything. Revelation 6, 9 to 11. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. Well, he didn't see souls like, you know, it's got a certain form or shape. He's talking about the people. I saw the persons, because the Hebrew soul is the person. But he saw the spirits, we could say, if it would help you understand, of those who were slain for the word of God and the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them, They should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So there is an intermediate state shown there. The Old Testament also shows that. From the spiritual side, physical death isn't just termination of the body's physical function, but it's the ushering in of the spirit, soul or spirit, into a place that's intermediate between the time of death and the final resurrection and judgment and so on. All right, that's the nature of physical death. It's dissolution of the body, separation of the body of soul, dissolution of the body, the spirit, physical death causes the spirit to go to the intermediate state. Then the cause of physical death next. From a physical standpoint, then there is a natural and an unnatural cause. Now, we're using natural here only in a non-technical way because no death is natural. We already know that. But there can be a natural cause with respect to it not being some tragedy. So, the cause of physical death, from the physical standpoint, will be a natural cause. God says in Genesis 3.19, Dust thou art, to dust you'll return. Speaking there only of the body, because man being dust is not eternal, so he could die of old age, without pain, without screaming his head off for a doctor. And we would call it 
a natural cause. And of course, unnatural cause. We're looking at the physical cause for death. There's unnatural causes, sickness, disease, accident, miscarriages, and a hundred other things. Earthquakes, fires, floods, unnatural. But from the moral or spiritual side, physical death is a result of sin. The cause of death may be just a natural cause, we said, or accident. Morally, spiritually, physical death is a result of sin. Genesis 2.17, God forbade Adam to eat of his tree. He said, Adam, there are a lot of trees out there in the garden that I made for you. You can eat of all you want. But he said, see that tree over there? That's my tree. Don't you touch it because thou shalt surely die. The Hebrew is dying, thou shalt die. That means you'll really die. Genesis 2.17. Then Romans 5.12. By sin, death entered the world. And so death has passed to all men because all of sin. 1 Corinthians 15, 21, in Adam all die. So the cause of death may be from the physical side, natural or unnatural cause from the spiritual side it's a result of sin he dies physically because man is a sinner thirdly the meaning of death what does death mean to man there's no one that ever thinks about it or faces it or experiences it or is involved in it in the family or loved ones that isn't affected by it. It's the most traumatic experience of the human nature is death. Even animals are aware of the unnatural thing that's occurring, you know, when one of their own dies. The meaning of death. Well, to all mankind in general, what does it mean? Now, we're not talking about Christians or sinners. We're talking about to all mankind. Death means to all mankind An inevitable experience. Every man believes, knows that it's an experience that all mankind will enter into. Romans 5.12. And as we said, that all die because all sin. Same passage we gave you. 1 Corinthians 15.21. And Adam all die. Hebrews 9.27. It's given unto men once to die and after that the judgment. So... All mankind, it means one thing. It means an experience that he or she looks forward to. There's just no way to get out of it, though an exception we already gave you. We're talking about physical death now, just physical death. Mankind, secondly, looks upon it as his great enemy. 1 Corinthians 15, 25 and 26. 1 Corinthians 15, 25 and 26. For Christ must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. You have no greater enemy. Because the one power that Satan had over the human race and Christ destroyed its effectiveness on behalf of the Christian was the power of death. Hebrews 2, for Christ has delivered us both from the fear and the power of death, saying that he overcame Satan at the cross. But it's the greatest enemy of man. If he could just figure out a way, you know, they've searched for the fountain of youth and tried in every way, facelifts and pep pills and vitamins and exercise. I mean, abnormal exercise, health spas and all of that. But the cells just get older. Watch what you confess there. Psalm 103 verse 5 is my confession, but we're just dealing with the fact as it affects the human race. Hallelujah. He restores my youth as eagles. 
That's my confession, Psalm 103, verse 5. I met a woman up in her 70s or 80s. I know 70s and so that I don't tell a white one and say it was 80s. I know it was 70s and I think she said 80s, but I know it was 70s. And she said, well, I found another fanatic. She heard me say that. I confess Psalm 103, verse 5 every day. I do every day. Why shouldn't I? You don't have to because I do. But anyway, she said, I've been doing that for years. She said, I am like 78 or 85. And I'm telling you, friends, you couldn't have believed she was over 50. And I mean a youthful 50. Because some people say, not over 50. Oh, he's old. (laughs) Or she's old. Well, in just a few very, very short time, you're looking at 57. And I'm not going to confess that that's old. The point being, whatever you think, there's some people who are 45 or 6 that look older than I do, but she was a youthful looking 50, one or two. I mean, you know, smooth skin, and she said, I confess that every day. Said, I'm glad to learn somebody else is is as crazy as I am. I said, no, I believe it. You get what you confess. Praise the Lord. And I still, sometime I'll make a slide of it, prove the point. I'll take a slide of my passport picture of 1966. That's 11 years ago. It doesn't matter what you think now. You won't believe that it's possible for God to do that. Well, that's hyperbole to make emphasis. The word means in Greek. Of course you will believe God can do it. Here you will. <laughs> I looked at it the other day. My passport had expired and I looked at it. It's, oh, I'll tell you. That's as close as you can <laughs> look dead and not be dead. <laughs> Many things wrong and I just suffered a heart attack and all of that and recovering from that. You wouldn't believe the same person. Those movies you saw don't really tell the story of me in 66. You should see this passport picture. See, the camera doesn't lie. Moving pictures can really deflect and deceive, and so almost anybody can look good in a movie. But that old passport camera doesn't lie. What are we talking about? I know where we are, but I don't know how we got there. We're talking about the meaning of death to all mankind. It's inevitable. It's the great enemy, right? The great enemy. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. All right. That's what it means to all mankind. What's death mean to the lost, the unsaved, the unregenerate? Well, the Bible says it's the loss of all they call good. It's the loss of all hope. The loss of all they call good. Right here in 1 Corinthians 15, 32. If after the manner of men I fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. In other words, to the world, that's the way they view death. Let's enjoy it. I heard somebody saying on the radio the other night, if you knew you were going to die, just had a week to live, what would you do? And he went through all of this, you know, real carnal, sinful things. He was going to live it up the last minute, last few hours. But that is the attitude of the world. Plane falling out of the sky, they'll gulp another drink of the cocktail so that it won't hurt so much when they hit the ground. Or start using profanity or whatever. That's their attitude toward death. That's what death means to the loss. It's the loss of everything they call good. Sex, gluttony, alcohol, whatever it is they call good. It's the loss of all hope to them. It's the loss of all hope. Luke 16, we've already seen that. We won't take time to read it where the rich man found that he had lost all hope. 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul tells us we don't have to sorrow when we die, our loved one dies, as those who have no hope. The lost have no hope. Death means to the unsaved. Thirdly, 
that it's an introduction to divine judgment. Hebrews 9.27 It's given unto men once to die, and then, after that, the judgment. That's what death means to the wicked. Now, that doesn't mean that they'll all admit that third point, but the scriptures tell us it's true. Death to all mankind, we said what that signifies, what it signifies to the unsaved. Now, what did it signify to the Old Testament saints? And then the New Testament saints, what does it signify? Well, in the Old Testament, their knowledge was incomplete, but they had some light. They had considerable light, but it was certainly incomplete. The Old Testament is an incomplete revelation. We know that. But they had some light. Psalm 23, 6. What did he say? He said, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Then after that, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David didn't have any morbid ideas about death or where he would be. Psalm 73, 24. The whole psalm, Psalm 73, raises the question of why the wicked prosper and the righteous seem to be going through such trial and tribulation. And he went into the house of the Lord, and there he got some light on the subject. In Psalm 73 and verse 24, he concludes, he says to God, You will guide me with your counsel, and afterward receive me in glory. Now, to say an Old Testament saint didn't know where he was going, I hear people teach, read the writings where the Old Testament saints didn't have any light or very little, and they had some gloomy, morbid idea about the afterlife. Well, that isn't scripture. That's neo-orthodox in liberalism. But there the psalmist says God will receive him to glory. And Job 19, 25 to 27 is... I believe, and many do, the oldest book in the Bible, the book of Job. Now, you recognize Moses comes after Job when he wrote the f Genesis and all. <laughs> Genesis, the events are older than Job, obviously. But the book of Job, we mean. Job 19, 25, 27. I believe Job had some light. Listen to this. In fact, I know he did. He says, I know my Redeemer liveth. And he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Talking about inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he sure had that. And though after my skin the worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh will I see God. Now, if you can read plain English, Hebrew, whatever, <laughs> and that says that in the Hebrew too. It says, after the worms destroy my body, he said, in my flesh I'll see my Redeemer. That means he believed in resurrection. <laughs> when I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. He says, my own eyes. He'll have eyes after his eyes are turned to dust. He'll one day have eyes to behold his Redeemer. Now, in Old Testament theology, I do a whole study on the Old Testament view of resurrection and so forth and so on. And there's much light in the Old Testament. But it's incomplete. But there's light because even Jesus makes a reference to that. When he said, I said to Moses, I'm not the God of the dead, I'm the God of the living. That means that Moses had a conception and view of the afterlife. But we'll get into that if we get back to Old Testament theology. Now, in the New Testament, death is clearly brought out into the open as nothing to be feared for the Christian. Death is something that's been conquered for the Christian. The Old Testament saint had some light, but it was incomplete. But in the New Testament, there's no question. We've got every cause for rejoicing. Even to die is a cause for rejoicing. In the New Testament concept. Why does death hold no fear? First of all, because its sting has been removed for the believer. 1 Corinthians 15, 56, and 57. Its sting has been removed. Ever been stung by a bee or a wasp? 
You wouldn't mind one lighting on your arm or nose if he didn't have a stinger, would you? Well, that's just what it means. Jesus, by shedding his blood, by his resurrection, has removed this. He didn't say mankind, Christians, wouldn't die, except that group at the end of the age. But he said he's removed the sting of death. 1 Corinthians 15, 56 and 57. The sting of death is sin. And the strength of, you know, what sin is, is seen in the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 55, O death, where is thy sting? And O grave, where is thy victory? Verse 54, death is swallowed up in victory. So the sting's been removed, why we shouldn't fear it. And yet, again, because Christians aren't taught as they should be taught, so often have such a morbid fear of death. Like the sister that said to me once, why do you preachers preach on the second advent? When we come to church, we want to be blessed and rejoice and be edified and inspired. And well, what do you answer people like that? <laughs> <laughs> the word says they're not saved if they're afraid to meet Jesus the reason that we don't fear death secondly because we have been enlightened to the fact there's no separation with Jesus Christ and death the body may go to the grave but there's no separation between life and death with respect to Jesus Christ. That's Romans 8, 38. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not even death, he says, will separate us. Now, proof that it won't separate us is given in other passages. 1 Thessalonians 5.10. The death doesn't separate you. In fact, it simply makes visible what is already a reality in the physical. Well, he's here. He's in me. He's in you. And death doesn't cause a separation except of spirit and body but the spirit doesn't separate itself from Christ you're immediately issued into his presence as far as you're seeing him now in the spirit and all you'll be in the spiritual presence nothing changes I know you'll have to go back through all the theology tapes and get the ideas about space and time and the deeper things we taught you he isn't off somewhere, and yet he's on a throne. But he's right here, too. And so death doesn't mean that I have to go somewhere to be with Jesus, yet I will go somewhere. But you see, you've got to get the studies under space and time and eternity and all that, because there's no space and time in God's eternity. These are just concepts to help us get up and down the steps and build houses that are square and all that. But... And you owe it to yourself to get that study because there you'll see that our little finite minds have made too often a finite God that people try to worship in their churches. Now I'm not saying heaven isn't somewhere. There is somewhere that's a heaven. There's a hell and a Hades somewhere. There are places. That isn't what I'm saying. But death doesn't change any relationship with respect to time and space you should get that out of your mind that when you die you are immediately conscious of what is already true that he's in you now we're face to face because that's what these other passages say like 1 Thessalonians 5.10 and others He died for us that whether we are awake or asleep, we live together with him. That's why I just said what I just said. It's been there all along. He says whether you're alive or dead, he's with you. That fact doesn't change. Now, 
It's hard for the finite mind to conceive of him being sitting on a throne and still in my heart. (laughs) But you see, the finite mind can't grasp the spiritual. No, it can't. Not the spiritual dimension. And all the visions in the world won't help you grasp its meaning. It will give some light. But we are creatures of space and time. I try as best I can when I'm dealing with the deeper things of the Word and God to divorce myself from thoughts of time and space because God is infinite. He created time for us so we wouldn't burn three-minute eggs or whatever, get to work on time. But there it is. He says, whether I'm awake or asleep, I'm with Jesus. But being spirit, the Holy Spirit can be in every believer at once. Second Corinthians 5.8 also teaches that death doesn't separate us from Christ. It merely opens our eyes to the fact that no separation ever took place. Second Corinthians 5.8 We are confident, I say, willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. In this case, in the spiritual dimension. Philippians 1, 23. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose I know not. For I am in a strait betwixt the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful from you. Now you put all those together with Romans 8, 1 Thessalonians 5, and you'll see there's no separation. There's simply a change of the physical to the spiritual. The point being that death holds no fear for the believer because there's no separation in death. Death becomes the door to the presence of Christ in a visible, real way that you can only take it by faith now. We walk by faith now, the scriptures say, not by sight. But then, and again, maybe most people don't know this, but then you're going to walk by sight. And people who hear nothing but the faith message have a little bit of trouble grasping that at first and not sure they want to say Amen. But I got scripture for that. One day I will behold him face to face. I'll be like him and behold him face to face. If I'm beholding him, oh, I didn't say we do away with faith. These three abide forever. Faith, hope, and love. That isn't what we said we do away with faith. But now I have to walk by faith with Jesus. But then I'll walk with him hand in hand, face to face, by sight. I'm going to see him. We're told our eye will behold him. Well, that's walking by sight. So you see, we weren't getting off the faith message after all. Then, to conclude our study tonight on death, then we take up the intermediate state next Wednesday. Occasionally, death for a Christian is a form of fatherly chastisement. We've got to add that as a footnote, or we haven't said it all. Occasionally, death for a Christian is a form of fatherly chastisement. That's made clear in 1 Corinthians 11, 27 to 32, where they were partaking of the Lord's Supper, communion in unworthy manner. And he says in verse 30, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Well, of course, that's the sleep of death. So if we judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. So sometimes death is a form of fatherly chastisement. Even then, it's not a lack of love, but that's the consequences sometimes of disobedience. And we could cite examples of people One man, one well-known evangelist in the early days of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I'm almost sure, this isn't something I read, but that I heard Gordon Lindsay say it. 
who knew the man personally. And no point in mentioning who it was because he himself made the confession from his deathbed. He said, the Lord's taking me. And he said, I know why. He said, I've had a difficult time reporting the truth about my meetings. Now that's how important it is to report the truth. And he had tremendous word of knowledge and gifts. It doesn't matter who you are. God keeps talking to you about a thing. You better straighten up because he doesn't have to give you three years, three months, three weeks grace. Scriptures say, he that being often reproved and hardeneth his neck shall be suddenly destroyed and that without remedy. That's the word of God. So he said, I just haven't been able to tell the truth. If 500 got saved, I always came back and reported 900. If there were two dozen miracles, I made it 50. If 100 received the baptism, I saw them as 500. Now he confessed that. He said, God's chastening me. And there wasn't any remedy for it. Not in his case. Because he had had such a tremendous anointing and gifts. And that's another thing. Not that God plays favorites, but the scriptures say, to whom much is given, much will be required. That's a principle set forth in the Gospel of Luke. So we mustn't neglect to point out that one aspect of the believer's death sometimes may be the form of chastisement. So there are a lot of incidences of that that we know of or that you could learn of.